All right. <clears throat> so we're going to, let's see, I am recording. That's good. And we're going to uh, jump into chapter four today. And uh, actually, we're getting, this is going to get us into the meat of chemistry. Up to now, it's just been preparatory work, learning about science. Uh, so let me see. I need to, nope, not that one. I need, I think, this one. Uh, nope, that's not it either. Here it is. Okay. Now let me turn that into a slideshow. Come on. Well, there it is. Now, okay. So these slides are ancient, as you probably already guessed. <clears throat> the color scheme and the format doesn't look anything like your current textbook, <clears throat> but I've modified them so heavily over the years, I can't bring myself to introduce a new set of slides and have to remodify them. So there's chapter four. And the way I originally taught the course, I had uh, this unit was chapter four, five, six, and seven. But that, I soon learned that that was too much for for one exam. So I chopped it down into logical pieces and chapter four and five will be exam two. And then we'll take six and seven for uh, the next exam. Okay, chemical foundations. So those are the topics that we're gonna cover. We'll learn about the elements, the structure of the atom, and the periodic table, how it, it's, approximate structure, not its complete structure yet. And then, um, let's see, I think chapter five, yeah, chapter five will be how to name compounds. So that we'll pick that up on the buffer day, um, Thursday. I think that's the way it goes. Yeah. You know, unless this goes really fast, we'll see how much time we got left. But I, I, I think we'll probably just do, we'll just do this chapter today. All right. <clears throat> so, um, chemistry revolves around uh, identifying the various different simplest substances that we know on the planet. Those are elements. Um, we don't get any simpler than elements unless we use nuclear methods to tear those elements apart, to tear the atoms of those elements apart. But as far as chemistry is concerned, elements are the simplest pure substance that we know. And we've identified um, 118 of them. In fact, the periodic table is now complete. Every element in the table has a given name. There are more placeholders. They've all got official names. <clears throat> um, originally, there were only 88 of them that could be identified in nature, natural elements, and the rest were man-made. But since then, uh, some of those that were originally man-made have been identified in nature. Um, and the reason for that is that um, our analytical techniques have become more refined and we can detect smaller amounts now. So whereas they were always there, we just never found them. And uh, we identified them first as man-made elements, but now we can find them in nature. And that, uh, that's why some sources say that um, 98 rather than 88 of those elements are naturally occurring.
Okay, so um, we identify each of the elements with a symbol. Um, the symbol could be uh, just like letters in our alphabet. We need to learn these symbols because they represent the elements. And um, analogous to our word building is writing compounds. We can write compounds and, and molecular formulas uh, just like we write words in English. But we need to know the alphabet. And the alphabet for chemistry is the symbols for all of the elements. Until you know those, you can't do you can't read and write chemistry any more than you could read or write English without under knowing the alphabet. So that's why um, this is, you'll find this in Blackboard in a couple of locations actually. Um, and it may say something like, uh, know these elements. And I've identified the ones that are important to us for this course. So you don't have to memorize all of the elements in the table. These that are not surrounded with red and sort of pink bin backgrounds, you don't have to memorize those. So all of these in here, here, over here, most of the lanthanides and actinides, you don't have to memorize those. Just a couple of them. Uh, this one and that one, uranium and plutonium. Um, and I want you to know those for their historical significance. Uh, uranium destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima in 1945. And a few days later, plutonium destroyed Nagasaki. The rest of them uh, are surrounded with these, these red blocks and pink bin. And I want you to, to learn those symbols. They represent elements. Um, and also you'll see these uh, that are highlighted in blue. Those blue are naturally occurring diatomic elements, which just means that if you put these elements into a, a chemical reaction, They have to be written with a subscript of two because they're actually two atoms put together to make the diatomic molecule for that element. And we'll, we'll get a little bit more of that later. I'm just pointing these things out now. This is what the table looks like. These are the elements I want you to memorize. Now, how do you do that? Well, notice that the names of the elements are not in this table. That's part of the learning process. You've got to dig, you've got to find those names. So you have the element symbols, go find the names for each one. And then uh, whatever method works for you, memorize the symbol associated with the name. Most of my students have had good success using flashcards. Uh, a couple have, have found flashcards on the internet that they can buy. They're already made. Um, and that's fine for them. But I think personally that making your own flashcards would help you memorizing the letters, the symbols. Because if you make your own cards using um, oh, uh, a stack of index cards, I got these, they're blank on both sides. That's doesn't matter really. You just write the symbol on one side and the name on the other. And as you're doing that, you're memorizing those those names and num and uh, symbols and then once you get the cards made you flash through them right you go through them you work through them one way you say you got the name on one side and you say the symbol is yeah turn it over if that's right put it in that stack if it's wrong put it in this stack and then you take the wrong stack and you keep working on that one until you get everything in the right stack then you go back and do it again this is I know it's uh, actually uh, memorization is an underrated skill, uh, especially for scientists, because what do scientists do? They try to make sense of the world. And while uh, good record keeping, you know, good notes so that you can go back and uh, look at what you were thinking 
before and what you concluded before, that's important. But if you're going to process information, it needs to be in your memory. So a lot of things you need to memorize and have ready to recall so that your brain can integrate them. And this is one of those things, learn those symbols. Um, and then once you've got the stack completed, go away for a few hours or even a day, come back, see how much you remember. And just keep doing that until you can do it, um, I'd say three times in a row, no mistakes. Then you've got those symbols back here. And then as you use them, they will become more deeply ingrained in your memory. All right. So we'll, I'll talk about the structure of the table a little more later. I just wanted to get this out there and um, also give credit to the man who uh, developed the system for naming elements. His name was Berzelius. He was a very well-respected chemist uh, in the, you know, it escapes me, late 18th century, I think, maybe the early 19th century. Uh, there were, were a whole host of different proposed systems for naming elements. And some of them were really weird. And I'm kind of glad that Berzelius won out. His was very simple. You just take um, a single letter to represent an element. And if you need uh, that letter again for a different element, then you just add a small letter behind it. So B was taken for boron, right? And we needed to name bromine. So we just take bromine, say B, and then we add a little R to it. They're always a capital followed by a small letter if there are two of them. Uh, and then other examples, let's see, C for carbon was already taken. So when we needed to name calcium, we had to add a little A on the end. You'll notice also some of these don't correspond to the English names, like F-E. What's F-E? Well, in English, it's iron. Well, so where did F-E come from? Fe is actually the abbreviation for the Latin for iron, ferrum. So Fe stands for ferrum. There are several of them like that. Um, Na for sodium, that's natrum in Latin. Uh, K is potassium from the Latin callium. Uh, let's see, copper is a little closer but it's CU because it's not CO for copper, it's CU for cuprum, which is Latin. CO is cobalt. Uh, let's see. Um, I was looking for some others. Okay, here's some. SN, right? Everybody got that in their uh, toothpaste. SN combined with F for fluorine is 10. SN is 10 for the Latin is stanum. Okay, so there's several of them like that. A great many of them are related to English, but others are uh, derived from the Latin. HG is mercury. It's uh, from uh, actually uh, a complex word, hydrogenium, which means water forming. Okay, enough said about that. Let's move down the road and we'll, we'll come back to the periodic table again and again. The periodic table is your best friend in chemistry, uh, in addition to uh, curiosity and boredom. So you want to hold on to curiosity and boredom to let you know that you're progressing. And then the periodic table is your best paper document. Okay. Um, 
the elements are not evenly distributed, either in the universe or in the uh, Earth's crust. So this refers to the distribution of these elements by mass percent. So what is mass percent? I hate it when people use words and don't define them. <clears throat> um, I remember when cell phones were becoming popular back in the late seventies, I think maybe early eighties. And they were, <laughs> they were, uh, if you ever see one in historical pictures, they were these big clunky things. They look like walkie talkies. They called them the brick. But they, people just started calling them cell phones and nobody bothered to define what a cell phone was. I had to figure it out, you know, what, the, what that means, what a cell phone means. So now I'm really careful to define my terms before I use them. And mass percent is one of those. Mass percent. It's the mass, in this case, the mass of the element divided by the total mass let's say total sample mass times 100 okay very simple so with that being said uh, oxygen makes up 49.2% of the Earth's crust, oceans, and atmosphere. And that makes perfect sense. If we look at the atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere is 20% oxygen. The oceans are made of water, which is hydrogen and oxygen, mostly oxygen. And in the Earth's crust, most of the elements uh, tend to be combined with oxygen oxides of metal. So when we uh, try to extract useful metals from the Earth's crust, like iron, we find that iron is combined with oxygen, iron oxide. And we have to release it from the oxygen by smelting the iron. So oxygen makes perfect sense as the most common element in the Earth's crust, oceans, and atmosphere. Uh, next is silicon. So why would silicon be so common? It's not particularly common in the ocean. It's definitely not in the atmosphere. So it must be in the Earth's crust. And walk any beach and your feet are covered in silicon. The compound is silicon dioxide, sand. Um, the structure of most of the rocks in the crust and the soils that cover it are largely compounds of silicon. Uh, that's one of the reasons that, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that silicon was chosen as the foundation for our semiconductor industry. So that we have flat screen monitors and TVs, we have computers, we have cell phones based on silicon. Because it's so common, really the main expense in using silicon is the purification process because in order to make a semiconductor you have to have absolutely pure silicon before you treat it and make it useful and that process is very expensive but the raw material is like like my grandparents would say common as hen's teeth aluminum is relatively common and very often found in combination with silicon, particularly in the soils, uh, but also in, in various minerals, rocks. Uh, and then the, the uh, abundance decreases in this list down from iron, calcium, sodium, potassium. We find deposits of these elements where they are concentrated for us by nature, but overall, averaged out over the entire surface of the earth, crust, oceans, atmosphere. These are the abundances. 
uh, I don't find gold on there, so it's gold is fairly rare. <clears throat> okay, um, what does the, the word element mean? I mean, I've been using it, and contrary to my uh, former statement, I didn't give you a, a really good definition of element. If we look at element in context, we see that it could mean a single atom, uh, written here as AR, right? Once you learn your elements, you'll know that's argon. And H, of course, is the simplest element, hydrogen, and actually the most common element in the universe. <clears throat> could mean a single element. It could be uh, a molecule, like the hydrogen as a diatomic molecule at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure, that's the way you find hydrogen if it is a distinct element. Of course, you don't want to have too much of it in the air because it's flammable. Just talk to anybody that survived the Hindenburg crash. Now yeah, they're probably all dead by now. <clears throat> but they knew what hydrogen could do. The Hindenburg was filled with hydrogen to make it buoyant. And all it took was a leak and a spark. And that thing went up in couple of minutes. Um, or the element could mean, uh, we could discuss elements in terms of where they're located, right? Elements in the crust, elements in the atmosphere, elements on the sun, elements in our body. The element is the distinct pure substance that cannot be simplified any further. In other words, when you have a, an element in your hand, hopefully it's not one that's reactive, <clears throat> when you have an element in your hand, you have a pure substance and it's composed of only one type of atom, the simple parts of that element the smallest parts are one type and with, with one proviso that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But chemically speaking, they're all the same. They react the same. They have the same physical chemical characteristics. That's an element. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier. How do we write the elements? One or two letter symbols. First one is always capitalized, and if there's a second one, it's a small letter. If you write it any other way, then it's wrong. Say for argon. If you write argon like this, that's wrong. Actually, that means Arkansas, right? Yeah, I believe that's the postal abbreviation for Arkansas. It's not argon. <clears throat> okay, those are examples. Sometimes they're derived from the Greek. I left out gold. Gold is AU, it's not GO. AU for aurum. I left out a good one too. Lead is PB. Large P, small B for the, the Latin word plumbum. And in Latin, plumbum means heavy, so it fits perfectly. Okay, this is an alphabetical list. This is not in the periodic table. You have one of these, this is straight out of your book. So if you have a symbol that you need to locate the, the name for while you're making your cards, I don't think these are, these are all the ones that you need to memorize. You need to go back to that table and identify which ones that you need to memorize. I wouldn't go from this list because some of those I may not insist that you know. Okay, what do we know about uh, elements and uh, the atoms that make them up? Well, our understanding of elements 
and, and how they behave has taken a very long time. Uh, John Dalton came up with the atomic theory in the uh, mid 18th century, I believe. And what, and these are premises, propositions for his theory. First, he said that most natural materials are some mixture of pure substances. Right? So what do we mean by that? A mixture is something that can be separated by physical means, which means that uh, we don't have to break any chemical bonds to get at the components of a mixture. For instance, um, if you mix sand and water, right, you get water and sand. They haven't changed. They're still water and sand. They're just mixed together. Well, how would you separate them? Well, one way is just wait, <laughs> time. Let the sand settle out and then decant off the water and you get most of the separation that way. Or if the particle size is smaller, it may take a long time for that to happen. So you may uh, pour it through a filter, a physical separation based on particle size through a filter. You had the mixture before with the, with the separate pure substances and you have the pure substances on the other side. Only now they are physically separated. So he said most naturally occurring materials are mixtures of pure substances. The pure substances can either be elements composed of one type of atom, and I'm using a word we haven't defined yet, right? The atom, the atom is the simplest part of that element. Can't get any smaller. Or it could be a combination of elements that we call compounds. A compound always contains the same proportion of elements. And in John Dalton's time, they only understood mass relationships. They didn't know at that time. Uh, in fact, this is, was part of the reason he was proposing the atomic theory was so that they could get at why the masses were consistent from one sample of the compound to another. For instance, if I have water, from two different sources, now Dalton didn't know this, right? He didn't know that this ratio was correct. Two atoms of, of hydrogen for one of oxygen. He just knew that that mass was due to oxygen and that mass was due to hydrogen. And the ratio was always the same. So this, this water comes from um, distillation. Right? We distill seawater, for instance, and we get pure water. This water comes from a chemical reaction. Now, it's not balanced. But we take hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, react them together, they burn, and you get water. At this point, you can't tell the difference. The ratio of oxygen to hydrogen is, is exactly the same, and the chemical characteristics of either one is exactly the same. Given compounds always contain the same proportion of elements. Okay? Uh, that's based upon the law of constant comp composition, or sometimes it's given as definite composition. Right? And this was, uh, this was one of Dalton's laws that he proposed before he incorporated it into his theory. So the law is older than the theory. So we might say that water contains eight grams of oxygen for every one gram of hydrogen. That's the ratio, one gram of hydrogen. Actually, the, the, that's the right ratio, 
it's uh, eight grams for every one gram of uh, oxygen to hydrogen. But in reality, on the molecular scale, for that molecule, it's actually 16 grams per two grams. All they knew was the ratio. They didn't understand yet the uh, atomic structure and the race and the relationship of numbers of atoms. The, Dalton's proposing that, right? It's coming. Carbon dioxide, for instance, has this ratio, right? So different compounds have different ratios of elements. They have different elements, but they also have different ratios of elements. So this atomic theory was proposed at the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, let me go back. These were propositions leading up to the theory. Okay, let me clarify that. This is what we knew and Dalton expounded before he proposed the theory to explain these things, okay? And this was one of the laws that went with it. There were other laws that he was explaining with the theory. Remember theories that say why, why does something happen? Law just says, this is the way it happens. You set up these set of circumstances, it always ends up over here with these results. But a theory tried to explain why that happened. So this is Dalton's explanation. He said that elements are made of tiny particles called atoms, right? Now that was not an original thought for Dalton. He actually borrowed that thought from the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks believed that everything was made up of tiny particles called atoms. And that's why they named them atoms. That means to cut or divide. And this means not. The prefix A in front of, in the Greek, A in front of any word means it, it's not what the word says. It's, it's opposite. So what that means is these particles could not be cut. They can't be made any smaller. What Dalton did was he went another step beyond that. <clears throat> the Greeks believed that all atoms were the same. For, for every substance, you have exactly the same element in every substance. So then they had to figure out, well, we painted ourselves into a corner now. How do we explain the differences of this substance versus that substance if they're all made of the same stuff. So then they had to spin it <laughs> and explain how that happens. So then they come up with their, their uh, elementary substances that go along with it, uh, earth, wind, fire, and water. So you combine those in various ways and you make those atoms behave a certain way. Well, of course, now we know they were wrong. <laughs> but uh, advancing science takes a very long time to get it right. Uh, and there were various theories proposed through the Middle Ages and into the modern era to explain why things happened the way they were. And it wasn't until Dalton proposed this theory that they started to get things right. Um, he, then he said that all these atoms of a given element are identical. So only the elements in a pure element sample are identical. And by uh, implication, the elements of a, a different, the atoms of a different element are different atoms. So now he's saying the atoms are actually different for the different elements. And that solved the problem right there. That was proposition number three.
for Dalton's theory. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, nitrogen and oxygen can combine in various different ways. If we combine one nitrogen and one oxygen, you get nitrogen monoxide. That's uh, chapter five. We'll talk about nomenclature, how to name them. This one, nitrogen and two oxygens, gives us nitrogen dioxide. And this one has two nitrogens and one oxygen, dinitrogen monoxide. Everybody knows this one, N2O. If you've ever been to the dentist and had some serious work done on your mouth, you may have breathed some of this stuff. This is nitrous oxide, laughing gas. Okay, so with these pictures, our illustrations added on to his theory. Atoms of one element can combine with atoms of the other element, and they form compounds. In fact, you only have a compound if you have at least two different elements. You can have more than two, but at least two makes a compound. Um, if you put two atoms of the same element together, you still got that element. You just have a molecule of the element instead of an atom. Right, so there's the distinction. Compounds have to have two different elements at minimum. Uh, and when they combine, a compound, no matter where it comes from, always has the same relative numbers and types of atoms. So these are three different compounds. Why? They may have the same elements combined, but they're in different ratios, right? And even if you look at the mass ratio, you'll find that the mass ratio is different for this one, and different for that one, and different for that one. And Dalton was trying to explain why that happened. And he said, changes, which now we're getting to real chemistry, substance changing from one to another, those changes are explained by rearranging the atoms. We don't create or destroy atoms of an element in a chemical reaction. We just rearrange them. Right. So what Dalton was doing was he was uh, incorporating uh, several laws into his theory and explaining why they work. Right. The one that he proposed, definite composition, uh, or let's say they, they used a different word here. Constant composition. I say definite composition. It's the same law. Okay. So um, he was incorporating that law. He was incorporating the law of uh, conservation of mass, which had already been proposed by Lavoisier, uh, which just said that you cannot create, you cannot destroy matter in a chemical reaction. And then there was another one that's a little more difficult to, to wrap your brain around, but it's true nonetheless. The law of uh, ah, uh, my mind's gone blank. If I can't remember it, I can't expect you to remember it either. But the point is there were several laws incorporated into Dalton's theory. And that was the purpose of his theory was to explain why these things happen. Now, with what we know today, which one of these is still true? Elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Yep, that's still true. That hadn't changed. All atoms of a given element are identical. 
Now, it depends on what you mean by identical. If we say they're chemically identical, that is they react the same way to any other atom they come in contact, then it's true. But if you say, are they identical uh, in terms of their mass for each atom, then no, they're not all identical. So we'll talk about those when we talk about isotopes. A given compound always has the same relative number and types of atoms. Yes, that's true. Still true, always will be true. Atoms are indestructible. Nope. We've proven that they, sometimes they come apart naturally, <laughs> called radioactivity. Sometimes we can blast them apart. That's true. That's true. The other two are not. So I'll come back to, to isotopes in a few minutes when we talk about the structure of the atom. So Roman numeral two and four in that list we'll cover in just a few minutes. Uh, assuming I have time. Chemical formulas describe compounds. Okay. So if we're gonna combine elements, we write the, the formula a certain way so that it tells us what types of elements, what, what are the atoms, and how many of them are there in the formula for that compound. And in order to do that, um, I've got another slide here, here, but I think this is a good time to introduce it. Uh, let's see, what else is here? This will be a good time. When we write, um, we, information can be conveyed by writing just the symbol for the element. And I'm gonna use a generic here. I'm gonna use an X. Let's say that's the symbol for the element. I can do that because there's no element on the periodic table that's just X. There's a Xenon, which is XE, I think that's the only one that has X in it, actually. But there are four positions, four corners here. And they can contain information about that element uh, in a free state, uh, in an ionized state, which I have to define also, in a compound. And then there are a couple of positions on there that are useful for uh, physics of the element. But for chemistry, we only need this one and that one. This says the number of atoms. So if you have a number down here, it says that's how many there are. Whether they're free, whether they're in the compound, whatever. Up here is charge. So it can be a number with a negative or a number with a positive to show the charge. Over here on this side, we reserve for things related to the structure of the atom. So on this side, we've got a position for the number of protons. And this one is the uh, mass number. Okay. So I'm going to come back to that in just a few minutes, but I wanted to emphasize for our purposes right now that this says how many of those atoms are in the compound. All right. So we write a formula and that's how we say how many of the atoms are there. If you've got the, the symbol, let's go back to this one. Notice I don't put a one down here. If you've got the symbol there, there's at least one. Otherwise, you wouldn't write the symbol. We wouldn't write that oxygen and then put a zero down here to say, well, I was just kidding. There's really no oxygen in that compound. Or I could say, uh, like that. No, just kidding. There's no sodium in that. That would be ludicrous. If the symbol's there, there's one of them. And then if there's more than one, you start putting numbers here to represent how many there are. 
Okay, so that's a chemical formula. Gives you the types of atoms in the compound and it gives you the number of each. So these are the rules, right? We've already mentioned that. You have the element symbol there and the subscript that says how many there are. And you don't write one if there's only one of them. So, for instance, if we were to write the uh, formula for DDT, uh, you're probably too young to remember DDT, but it used to be a very, very effective insecticide. In fact, <clears throat> when it was in common use, DDT was uh, dusted on people to get rid of lice. It was that safe. Um, it was also sprayed to eradicate mosquitoes. So in the process, uh, among other things uh, like personal hygiene and cleaning up swampy standing water areas, but DDT in addition to that wiped out the carriers for uh, malaria and yellow fever. So there for a while, we thought they were completely eradicated. Then the environmentalists came along and said, you can't use DDT anymore. It's killing baby chicks. The DDT um, would be what we call trophically amplified. What do we mean by that? Well, trophic means to eat. So, um, maybe one of these infected mosquitoes or dead mosquitoes would be eaten by a bird. And then uh, some other animal would eat the bird and then another animal would eat that one. And DDT is a fat soluble compound. And fat soluble compounds get stored in the body. They go into the, the adipose tissue and they stay there for a while. So they tend to accumulate. Uh, so uh, up the food chain or the food web actually, then the higher order uh, predators would eventually accumulate so much of the DTT and its breakdown products that it would affect the integrity of the um, birds of prey and their eggs that they laid. It would weaken the cells. So when they set on them to roost, they crack them and destroy the egg. Um, so DDT was out, couldn't use it anymore. We had to look for substitutes. Uh, and consequently, the incidence of malaria and yellow fever are skyrocketing worldwide. People are dying because we're saving birds. So it's a difficult choice, I understand. But let's get back to the problem. <laughs> if we were to write the formula for DDT, and we know here that there are 14 carbons, so you need to know what carbon is. And then you say, there are 14 of them. And then you need hydrogen, and you need nine of those. And then uh, chlorine, and you need five of those. So now that is the formula for DDT. Okay, let's talk about the structure of the atom. <clears throat> I mentioned the fact that um, Dalton's atomic theory fell apart in two places. And um, uh, both of them are due to the fact that atoms do have structure. They have subatomic particles that are responsible for forming the atom and making this atom different from that atom. Okay, so it was a slow process, but some notable scientists 
are given credit for elucidating various parts of the atom. J.J. Thompson was one of the first. Um, he was an Englishman, and he identified the origin of a negative particle coming from the atom. And that negative particle we now call the electron. Okay. He proved that it was negatively charged and that it originated from within the atom. And he did his experiments using cathode ray tubes, right? If you know what a cathode ray tube is, uh, if you've ever seen uh, an old television, the ones that are, have big boxy things on them, they have a cathode ray tube as their picture tube or old uh, computer monitors were big bulky things and they were made with cathode ray tubes incorporated. What they did was they, they had a source here that was negative and it fired electrons right to the other side which was positively charged and they went from one side to the other if you wanted this electron to strike your computer screen in a different place and do it fast enough then you can create an image on your screen with those electrons you just need a way to guide them well jj thompson understood that you could guide those electrons passing through his tube. Let's see, there's a picture of it. By either creating an, another electric field across the middle somewhere, so positive, negative on either side, you create that electric field and you could bend the beam and it would bend toward the positive electrode. So he knew they were negatively charged. You could also, Take a horseshoe magnet and just stick it over the thing and bend the beam as well. So the, with those two bits of information, he proved that the, the particles that were passing from one side to the other were negatively charged. Now, um, he knew that they were not light beams, right? Because light will not respond to an electric or a magnetic field. Light only responds to a gravitational field, and it has to be a big one to do that. So we knew there were particles. And there were other experiments that were done uh, by him and others where they put inside their tube, they put um, like a little pinwheel. And if the pinwheel sat still when these, the beam hit it, then we know that the, there was no particle, there was no mass. Otherwise, Anything with mass, when it hit the pinwheel, would make it spin. If it was light, um, well, actually, <laughs> I'm diverging too far. Light will actually make it spin. So light has some momentum of its own, but uh, the way it accomplishes it is a conversion from light, from uh, energy to matter. And that's another topic. Anyway. Thompson proved that we were talking about electrons. So we knew that atoms had uh, negatively charged particles inside their structure. Well, naturally, we knew that atoms, elements, were neutral. That is, they did not have a charge. A pure element will not be charged. So that begs the question, what's neutralizing that negative charge? There has to be another particle in there that's positively charged. And that turned out to be the proton. We abbreviate that or symbolize it with a P and a plus and this one with an E and a minus. Okay. So now we had those two particles identified and other scientists some speculate that J.J. Thompson himself proposed this model, but uh, others attribute it to William Thompson, who was, who was also known as Lord Kelvin, same guy that invented the Kelvin temperature scale. 
proposed the plum pudding model. And they said, okay, we've got these electrons in here, but the positively charged part of the atom is uh, the rest of the matrix. And they're equal in magnitude. Uh, so they said, well, it looks like plum pudding. The positively charged part of the atom is this uh, pudding stuff and the little fruit pieces of fruit in there. I can't remember what they are, raisins or gooseberries or something. Those are the electrons. The plum pudding model, they call it. Okay, so that was, that was a hypothesis, right? This is what we think is causing the structure of the atom to be neutral. We know we have elect electrons. There must be other positive parts that are responsible for neutralizing them. So we say, okay, it looks like a plum pudding. That was the simplest model they could think of. Well, um, more information was proposed and proved for the electron. So while Thompson proved that the electron existed, uh, he couldn't say anything more about it. He didn't actually know the charge on an electron. Uh, so uh, it was up to Robert Millikan, an American, uh, to devise an experiment for actually measuring the charge on an electron. And it's known as the elementary charge. Can't get any smaller than that. Electron has this amount of charge. That's as small as you can get. And he determined in his oil drop experiment, and I'm not sure if I have a, a video or a, a, a figure showing that the instrument, but suffice it to say, uh, it took a lot of time, a lot of effort and repetition, thousands of times doing the same experiment over and over. Uh, he determined that the charge on a single electron was 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th Coulomb. Coulomb was a unit of charge that had been developed by other scientists, uh, actually named after a scientist, Coulomb. Um, and he determined that the charge was that value on an electron. He used that information to then further do experiments with his oil drop apparatus. And he determined the mass of the electron was 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Very, very small. And in fact, he received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1923 for his work on the electron uh, in addition, they incorporated that with his work uh, experimentally ver verifying the photoelectric effect equation that had been developed by Albert Einstein a few years earlier. Okay, so we know we have an electron and we know that something in there is responsible for the positive charge. They just didn't know that it was also another particle called the proton. They just thought the matrix of the pudding was positively charged. Ernest Rutherford, an Englishman, uh, proposed an alternate theory, an alternate hypothesis, I should say, for the structure of the atom that would account for the neutral atom having a negative particle, and he proposed a positive particle. His explanation was called the nuclear atom. The nuclear atom has a very dense center to it. And in that dense center, which is responsible for most of the mass of the atom, there resides a positive particle called the proton. So if this is very dense and most of the mass of the atom is there and the electrons are out here somewhere, then um, he could devise an experiment to compare 
whether the plum pudding model was accurate or the, um, his model was accurate. So he said, here's what's happening. If the plum pudding model is accurate, and it's just positive plum puddings, and then we have these negative electrons scattered throughout, then what if I shoot a very heavy particle at those atoms? And by this time, radioactivity had been worked on, and we had sources of radioactive elements that produced a very heavy particle. It had already been identified as the alpha particle. And it had a two plus charge, and it was extremely heavy, compared to other particles. We now know that it's a helium nucleus. Okay, so he, he could, if I fire these particles at this plum pudding model, they'll all go, every one of them should end up right there because there's nothing dense enough in there to deflect them, right? We know that the electron doesn't weigh anything much if the mass of the positive for the rest of the atom is scattered in this plum pudding, then there's really no concentration of mass here to stop the alpha particles. It could slow them down, right? But they'll still all end up right there, okay? He says, uh, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think what it, the atom is, is a very dense nucleus with positively charged protons in it. That's where all of the mass virtually resides in the atom. And the negatives are out here somewhere, right? And he knew from uh, Millikan's work that the mass of the electrons was virtually nothing. So if these alpha particles pass this way, they go straight over here. Right, to make a nice spot on that side. But if they encountered the nucleus, it was dense enough that it would either deflect and we, our detectors would pick it up over here or deflect this way, or it may even bounce straight back. So Rutherford devised his gold foil experiment. And uh, this was uh, Thompson's model, the plum pudding model. And if he were right, we'd get this spot over here on the detector. And that's the only spot. But if Rutherford were right, and his nuclear atom were the true model of the atom, then we would get these uh, other indicators, deflected uh, particles would hit his detector all around here. And that's exactly what happened. Why did he use gold foil? Well, he knew that if the target was very thick, then a lot of these would, could slow them down and uh, adulterate his experiment. It would be di more difficult to argue for his model. So what he needed was a very thin layer, just maybe three or four atoms thick. And he knew that gold was very, the, the technology for making thin sheets of gold was well developed. You just put it between pieces of paper and leather and hammer it and just keep hammering. And eventually you get very thin, paper thin, you can blow it away with your breath. Just a few atoms thick. So he used the gold foil. Um, our state capital in Charleston is covered with gold foil. And most of the cost of that renovation was in the labor, right? The materials, the amount of gold on the, on the capital's dome is almost nothing, right? It's, it's so thin, maybe an ounce of gold for the whole thing, or a few ounces at most, uh, because you can hammer it very thin. All right, so um, this radioactive element supplied the alpha particles, 
and they smashed into the gold foil. Some of them were deflected. They proved that the nuclear atom was the correct interpretation, which means that we have a positive particle with a lot of density, a, a lot of mass, and we have a negative particle with almost no mass, but with opposite, equal, equal magnitude, but opposite charges. Okay. Well, that's just an animation showing <laughs> what it might have looked like. <clears throat> and another possibility. Ah, that's enough of that. <laughs> so this is just a summary. Um, I did. I left out uh, Millikan's work in here. It should be stuck right in here. So I have to modify the slide to incorporate that. Now, up to that time, uh, Rutherford's model was was uh, perfectly acceptable. In fact. Um, Rutherford had a graduate student. His name was Chadwick. And Chadwick went on to uh, investigate further the structure of the atom. And Chadwick determined I think while he was still a graduate student with uh, Rutherford, Chadwick determined that the mass of the proton was not sufficient to account for all the mass in the atom. The electron had virtually no contribution. Protons contributed a lot, but there must be something else in there, something with no charge, but mass that was comparable to the proton to account for the rest of the mass of the atom. And he identified and proved that it was The neutron, it has uh, just very slightly more mass than the proton, but no charge. And it was located in the nucleus. So now our modern concept of the atom incorporates those three particles, electron, proton, neutron, but it still doesn't explain all the behaviors of atoms. So now we have what's considered a modern concept of the atom in which the electrons are not really considered particles, although sometimes they behave as particles, right? It's, it's like the dual nature of light. Light can be seen as either a particle or a wave which is another way of saying energy. They have this dual nature. Electrons are the same way. In fact, all matter has the dual nature of particle and energy. <clears throat> but that's another discussion. So now we, we uh, consider electrons to be waves, energy waves, that occupy a certain uh, space and time position around the atom. Uh, and they, they occupy regions of space that we identify using probability because of another principle that I won't go into right now. <clears throat> but if you know where the electron is, you can't say how fast it's going. And that's true for any particle. Or if you know how fast it's going, you can't say exactly where it is. So probability is invoked to finish describing the atom. And that comes from, now we call it the quantum theory. Okay, so that's the progression of the structure of the atom. Oh, I did have a thing on Chadwick. Sorry, <laughs> I thought I'd left this slide out. Chadwick uh, proved that there was a neutral particle in there also with the proton, 
uh, except for one element. Hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton. Uh, let's see, one proton. But they also discovered that there were certain types of atoms of hydrogen that could have only one proton. But if we add a neutron, then the mass number becomes two. Mass number is number of protons plus number of neutrons. So most of the hydrogen atoms have one proton and that's it. So its mass number is one. But there are uh, certain atoms of hydrogen that have a neutron in addition to a proton in the nucleus. That's called deuterium. And some of them actually, actually have two neutrons in there. So they have a mass number of three. That's called tritium. And those elements become significant when we talk about nuclear fusion. It's, it's easier to fuse deuterium and tritium than it is to fuse uh, hydrogen one proton hydrogen. So we use them in nuclear fusion. In fact, the first place they were used was in the hydrogen bomb. Okay, uh, let's get back to the topic here. Um, so now, the modern concept of the atom is it contains electrons, which are really waves, contains protons in the, in the nucleus that are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged, and it contains neutrons, which have no charge, but contribute to the mass of the atom. <clears throat> we do know, uh, basically, since Rutherford's time, that the size of the nucleus is very small compared to the size of the atom. Most of the atom is empty space, occupied by these electrons, which is Actually, not accurate. If it's if it's empty space, then there's nothing there. But it's uh, lots of free space occupied by electrons that virtually have no mass. Okay, now we know the ratio, right? If the electron is one unit of mass, then the proton and the neutrons are about 1,800 times that. So there's a huge difference in mass. But even since we know that this is uh, a very small, like what was it, 10 to the minus 35 kilogram, then a thousand times that is, <laughs> is still pretty small. But the ratio is, is huge. So why do atoms have different chemical properties? Right? We know from experience, from ancient times, that um, uh, sodium, which could be isolated and was isolated even before modern chemistry, uh, reacted cert a certain way with different elements. But uh, things like, I don't know, chlorine reacted differently. And when you put sodium and chlorine together, you get a, a violent reaction. Or when you put sodium in water, you get a violent reaction of a different type. So why do atoms act differently? Think about it. What are we attributing to the chemistry of atoms? Dalton said it's just a combination of, of different atoms of elements, right? So when they approach one another, if they're going to uh, act in a certain way, what do they see first? We know from Rutherford's postulate of the nuclear atom that the first thing they see is their electrons. So the interaction between the atoms is with the electrons of one atom and the other. Okay, that's responsible for the chemistry of the atom. Of course, we know that the behavior of the electrons is based upon the entire structure of the atom, and that means the neutron has control. But um, when two different atoms approach one another, um, 
before they see the nucleus, they see the electrons of their neighbor. And the intermingling of those electrons in certain ways are responsible for the combinations that become uh, molecules. Hey! I'm talking to you. Sorry, my cat. You're ripping up my uh, door frames. Uh, okay. So, since all electrons are the same, then there must be something about the way that they are positioned and how many there are around each of the atoms that make the reaction uh, different for different types of atoms when they combine. It turns out that it's uh, predominantly the number of electrons that determine chemical behavior that surrounding the, the element. But we now know also that it's how much energy those electrons have, right? And when you talk about energy of an electron, you're actually saying, how far is the electron from the nucleus? So if you have a nucleus here, and you have an electron here, versus an electron there, this electron is higher energy relative to the, the nucleus than this one. This is low energy, this is high energy. In fact, if you've got lots of electrons, then the first electrons that the, are encountered by the neighbor coming in are these higher energy electrons. We have a name for those. They're called valence electrons. And the valence electrons are the ones that are responsible for reactivity. Okay, now to isotopes. I mentioned that in terms of hydrogen, um, the elements can be the same. Two atoms can be the same element, but if they have different numbers of neutrons, then they are different isotopes of that element. Now, I wanna emphasize this point. Uh, the identifying characteristic of an element that says this element is different than that element or an atom of this element is different than the atom of that element is the number of protons. The number of protons determines the identity of the element. So when we say um, that element has four protons and it's often uh, identified as Z. What's the Z number? The number of protons, the atomic number. If it has four, that means it's uh, beryllium. If you see that symbol, then you know there has to be a four. Or if you see that four, you know the symbol has to be beryllium. Can't have one without the other. And if you change the number of protons, you change the element. So in your periodic table, um, at least in the one that I've given you, the lower left-hand corner has a number in it. That's the atomic number. And that atomic number says, this is how many protons are in that element. So if you have different number of neutrons, that's fine. As long as it's the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, you have isotopes of the same element. Now, uh, for our purposes, their chemical properties are identical. But in reality, their chemistry is just ever so slightly different. But we're not going to labor that point. For our purposes, consider isotopes as identical chemically. Now, the natural occurrence in, in, uh, of isotopes is a mix for each of the elements. Most of them have a predominant one isotope that is 
uh, the lion's share percentage composition, most of them are this isotope. And then you have minor isotopes uh, uh, below that. There are a few exceptions, like um, I think chlorine, it has almost equal amounts of two isotopes. <clears throat> so here's an example. Sodium, right? There's 11 protons, 11 protons. So we know they're both sodium. But this one has 12 neutrons and this one has 13. So the mass number for one is 11 plus 12 is 23. And that's often abbreviated as A. What's the A number? This is the Z number. A is the mass number. And it's always a whole number, a summation of the protons and neutrons. This one might be 24. So if you're just given that information, you can say it has 11 protons and 11 subtracted from 24 is 13. It has 13 neutrons. So with that information, you can say, this is how many protons, this is how many neutrons. And if it's neutral, if there's no charge up here, we can also say how many electrons there are. If it's neutral, the protons and the electrons have to be equal in number. If you have a charge up there, like this, how many electrons are there? Ten electrons if it's plus one charge sodium. Why? Because before there were eleven. And we took away one which imbalanced it toward the positive one. In fact, that is the only way you can make a charge on an element without changing the element. If you've got sodium neutral atom and you want to make an ion out of it, don't touch the protons. You can only do it with electrons. So if we say take away an electron, we have an extra proton now, positive one. If we add an electron, now we have an excess of electrons, minus one. So that's what happens with chlorine. Right? Chlorine is uh, 17. And we won't worry with the mass number right now. If we make chlorine into a negative ion, which is its preferred charge, then we know that we have 18 electrons. Okay? That's how you make a charge. Electrons only. Okay, so here I'm talking about the symbol and um, what each of the letters mean. Uh, here's an example for carbon. I will also say um, that this A value, the mass number, is not the same as the atomic mass. Okay, that is often confused. The mass number is a whole number, always the sum of the protons and neutrons. The atomic mass is reported in your table. In the upper right hand, no, upper left hand corner in this table. And it's always a decimal fraction. The reason for that is that mass number takes into account the natural abundance of each of the isotopes. So if you have a contribution of one mass number of a percentage in the naturally occurring element, and then a different mass number of a different percentage, then the weighted average of those two together gives you the atomic mass. Okay? So let's move ahead. And I know I'm gonna run out of time, so I'll just keep going. If you have to leave, that's fine. Uh, we've got another maybe 15 minutes 
before the class is officially over. But I'm going to finish the lecture. So carbon. Why are we interested in carbon? In this case, carbon has six protons and eight neutrons, which makes carbon 14. That's not the most abundant isotope of carbon. In fact, that is a radioactive version of carbon. It will decay over time and disappear completely. In fact, this is the isotope that's used to date once living material. Once something dies, it no longer incorporates carbon from the atmosphere into its tissues. So after it dies, it starts the radioactive decay process. And by determining the ratio of what's left to what should have been there before, which is another question, then you can say this is how long this uh, living material has been dead. How long has it been buried, so to speak? But that's not the most abundant carbon isotope. This is the most abundant one, carbon-12. It still has six protons, but now it only has six neutrons. Okay. That carbon isotope is also significant. Uh, let's see. We may have a slide on it, but I'm going to talk about it right now. So why is the carbon 12 isotope significant? Because scientists needed a reference point. They really weren't sure um, about the relationship between uh, masses of one isotope or one element to another. So they needed a reference point. Originally they picked oxygen right, because everything reacts with oxygen, but it became more too difficult to standardize. So they settled on carbon. So carbon of that isotope was arbitrarily given the mass of 12 atomic mass units. Okay, that's it. I mean, that just said, this is it. Everything else is referenced to that one. So this one may have 12 neutrons and protons together, but those together equal 12 units. All right, so we established a single unit by saying this has 12 of them. Okay, simple. Now everything else, when you compare the mass of one to the other, you're saying that um, its mass has so many mass units compared to this one as the standard. And the reason they picked carbon 12 is it's, it's abundant, it's common. It's easy to find carbon and purify it and actually isolate this isotope to compare with other elements. Okay. Um, I won't go into the technology about that comparison just yet. Needless to say, it's very expensive and requires years of training for your technician to operate it correctly. <clears throat> So let's say an isotope uh, contains 23 protons and 28 neutrons. This is a, a, a exercise to see if you understand what's happening, what you've learned so far. What's the mass number of this isotope? Well, if you have 23 protons and 28 neutrons, just add them together. That's the mass number. So it'd be what, 51? So the mass number is 51. What's the element? Well, if it has 23 protons, that means its atomic number is 23, and you can go to your periodic table, and they're in order, left to right, top to bottom, increasing atomic numbers. So we can follow it across and follow it across and say, okay, 
oh, there's 20, 21, 22, 23. 23 is a V. V stands for vanadium. So the element is vanadium. Now, <clears throat> we've organized all of these elements into a periodic table. And it used to be that um, it was every scientist for himself. <laughs> you know, you, you compiled your list of elements and you compiled your list of, of weights that were associated with them compared to other elements. This is before the standardization with carbon-12. Right? This is way before then. So you had your own list. And uh, if you talk to some other scientist about such and such an element, you had to spend time saying, well, I think it's this value for its weight and for other characteristics. And the other scientist says, well, I think it's this and this. So you try to come to some consensus before you can talk about that element. Well, so it was obvious that what we needed was a standardization of information about each of the elements. And that was accomplished by several scientists, but ultimately um, was uh, presented to the world as a table by Dmitry Mendeleev, a Russian. Um, <clears throat> and he created his periodic table. Actually, this is this was his uh, first publication. So it was kind of a mess. But eventually, um, we, he refined it. And he said, OK, this group right here has these elements have common characteristics, physical and chemical characteristics that would put them in a group. In fact, sometimes they call them families. And they all behaved similarly. They weren't exact, but they were similar. And he noticed that when he put them in these groups, and then he, he uh, said, OK, based on weights also, they should go in this sequence from left to right, and then the groups are up and down, then um, when he did that, he noticed that there were gaps missing. There were places in there where there should be an element in that family because of the mass that it should have, progression of masses. So he said, there's something missing here. So I'm going to leave that open. And he said, in that spot uh, here, these blanks, in those spots, he said, someday someone's going to purify and identify that element. And these will be its characteristics, physical, chemical, weight, will fit that spot. And notice there were no atomic numbers here. They didn't know atomic numbers in these days. They only knew masses. He said, okay, when they find that element, it's going to have these characteristics and it's going to weigh this much. Sure enough, they found it eventually, plugged them in his table and it fit. That's why Mendeleev is given credit for uh, producing the first useful periodic table because of its predictive qualities. It could predict the occurrence of an element before it was discovered. <clears throat> okay, so this is what our table looks like now. Well, one representation. You can go on the internet and find all kinds of weird periodic tables, different shapes, where the blocks are different sizes, depending on their relative abundance. Uh, they could be spirals. Uh, personally, I think that's just confusing, but some people like them. So whenever I need information, I go back to this format. So up and down, we have groups. So these elements, particularly this column, that column, then these six columns over here, the family characteristics are reasonably consistent. When you get into the transition elements, 
then you find that from one to the other, they're, they're not really consistent. And it, it took some doing to figure out why that was. So what we call, we call these two columns and these six columns as the representative elements. And they each have different names, but we'll cover those in just a minute. All right, so why are they organized this way? Well, the groups say these are common characteristics and they're organized from left to right, increasing mass, also increasing atomic number now, 29, 30, 31, 32, left to right. But when we get to this one and we go to 37, we find that the one with atomic number 37 has characteristics that are consistent with this group. So we need to put it over here in this group. That means we have to wrap around. So that's why it's called the periodic table. So periodically, we have to wrap around. And this is called a period. Okay, so the table, uh, let's see. Where do we get the atomic number? I'll digress for a second. The atomic number came from the work of a young scientist in England called Henry Mosley. And in 1914, he published his list of atomic numbers for the elements. Now, he didn't base it upon the knowledge that there were protons in there. He based it upon spectroscopy. In fact, a specific type of spectroscopy using x-rays. He would take pure elements and irradiate them with x-rays. And they would consequently absorb that energy and then re-radiate that energy in certain distinct wavelengths of light. And he focused on one of those places in there, regions. And he found that uh, he could predict the wavelength of light coming out of the element was different than the next element. And the difference between those two wavelengths was a multiplier. And that multiplier was a whole number. And the whole number was in sequence with the elements and their masses. So he said, okay, this one has a whole number multiplier of three and it has that mass. So I put the three there and the four there and the five there. So he independently confirmed that the reason that he was getting that multiplier was because these different elements had different atomic numbers, different protons. That was Henry Mosley. Unfortunately, Henry Mosley in his mid twenties, I think he was about 24, was called to war, World War I. He went to war and died. So that was the end of his career. Okay, the periodic table can be divided into, into two major sections. All right, uh, let's see if I've got a, here we go. Uh, I've already described what these mean. So I'm just gonna go to the periodic table. And why is it shifted off to the left, like the right like that? hardly see it. Okay, it's still on the screen. That's just, I was covered up by something else. All right, I need to fix that. It shouldn't be shifted over to the left like that. <clears throat> uh, major division. This black line is the dividing line between metals on the left over here and non-metals on the right. Metals have, have a, a common characteristic. They're malleable, right? Some of them are so soft you can scratch them with your fingernail. Um, they can be shaped. They can be drawn into thin wires without breaking. That's called ductility. Um, if you polish them, they're very shiny. They have a luster. If they're very finely divided in very small particle size, then they're really just black. But if they're, if they're in a chunk and you 
smooth off the surface and polish it, they'll shine. Uh, Nonmetals won't do that. Nonmetals are uniformly dull if they're solid. Or they might have uh, actually a color. Uh, metals are nearly always solid, with one exception, mercury. At room temperature, mercury is a liquid. Uh, slightly above room temperature, gallium becomes a liquid. I think its melting point is in the neighborhood of 35 degrees Celsius. So you can take a chunk of gallium in your hand and it'll melt because the body temperature is what? 37 degrees Celsius. But most of them are solid. Um, whereas nonmetals, they can be anything. They can be solid, liquid, or gas. Several of them are gases. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine. Bromine's a liquid. Iodine's a solid. So in that one family, you've got gas, gas, liquid, solid. Um, okay, so those are metals, nonmetals. Now, why do I have these yellow blocks in here? These yellow blocks identify uh, elements that are often called metalloids, which means sometimes they behave like metals, sometimes they behave like nonmetals. One second. Sorry for the interruption. <clears throat> These metalloids, depending on their environment and the reaction that may take place, they may behave like a metal or non-metal. And these are the elements, uh, plus their neighbors, that hopefully we'll talk about at some point, um, are used in the semiconductor industry. They're silicon. That's the base. But uh, that doesn't say that you have to make semiconductors out of silicon. You could make them out of germanium. In fact, um, silicon is prone to errors in information. Uh, simply the, the impingement of a cosmic ray uh, on a, a computer chip will cause it to experience a shift from a, a zero to a one. Remember, all computers are digital, so it's either zero or one, and they're prone to that, right? So if you're gonna use silicon in a harsh environment like space, you've got to protect it, you got to shield it, or you gotta make it out of some material that doesn't respond that way to uh, cosmic rays or other types of influence, electromagnetic pulses, for instance. So if, um, if our enemies uh, set off a nuclear bomb 100 miles up in the atmosphere above this country, it would shut every computer down and it would uh, destroy our electricity grid because the electromagnetic pulse generated by that explosion would fry our computers, except for those that were shielded. So these uh, metalloids, uh, it's convenient that they can have both uh, me metallic or non-metallic characteristics under different circumstances. Then you have family names, right? So this first group, excluding hydrogen, we put hydrogen over here just for balance, right? Hydrogen over here, helium's over there. So the first period is just hydrogen and helium. <clears throat> hydrogen is really an animal to itself. It's a gas, right? So it's not really a metal. The metals start right here with lithium. So these are alkali metals. That's that family. These are alkaline earths or alkaline earth metals. Uh, these far right are noble gases. <clears throat> They're noble or inert gases because they don't react. And hopefully I'll show you why that is later. This group is the halogens, right? So everybody knows that 
uh, before LEDs, the, the light beams in your car lights in the front were halogen light bulbs. They had, uh, I think, iodine in them, which made them more efficient and brighter. Uh, the next to them are the calcogens. The calcogens refers to oxygen's reactivity. So this oxygen group is called the calcogens. The nitrogen group is called nictogens. The P is silent. Uh, and this area in here, all of these are called transition metals because you're transitioning from one side to the other, I guess. <clears throat> but they don't have individual. Well, there are um, groups within here, like the noble metals. The noble metals include uh, gold, platinum, and palladium. Those are noble metals. Um, these other families here, the boron carbon family, don't have names. The lanthanides, this whole group right here, should fit right here next to lanthanum, right in that crack. See, it goes from 57 to 72. That crack right there is where these guys fit. Similarly, the actinides from 89 to 104, between there is where the actinides would go. And they're called actinides because actinium is the first element here and the lanthanides for lanthanum there the reason we pull them out, well, two reasons actually. One is to keep the periodic table from being a mile wide. So we just pull them out. And the other reason is because and they have similar electronic structures. Right? And we'll talk about that later, hopefully. Um, okay, so that's the overall structure of the periodic table. And um, we're gonna add elements to element, not, not uh, atomic elements, but uh, uh, logical elements to this discussion as we go to help, help us understand the periodic table and how to use it more effectively. Okay. Let's see, I've got something covered up here. Let me move that over. And these are things that I've already mentioned. Another version of the periodic table. Most elements in their pure state are very reactive. In other words, they don't like to be pure elements. They don't like to be element only. Uh, exceptions to that, gold is the, is the most uh, desirable exception. You find gold in nature in nuggets, pure, or in dust. You know, it may have some minor inclusions from other elements, but for the most part, it's pure gold. So elements are generally not found in uncombined forms, pure form, except for the noble gases, right, because they don't react but most elements do react. And metals, they like to react with oxygen. So that's why oxides of the various metals are predominant in the Earth's crust. And when you go mining for these metals, you're going to find them as oxides, sometimes sulfides, uh, occasionally chlorides, uh, but they're not free elements. They have to be separated from their compounds to be identified and used as pure elements. The noble metals, I left out palladium here. Palladium is a noble metal too. Noble gases. Uh, diatomic molecules, right? So chlorine is a diatomic molecule. 
Uh, sodium is not. Sodium is a metal. Right? So when you react sodium and chlorine together, you get uh, sodium chloride. Right? Sodium has its characteristics. Chlorine has its characteristics. Sodium chloride, the compound of the two, completely different characteristics. But they very much want to react together. If you put them in close proximity, I guarantee a reaction. So what about these diatomic molecules? Well, they're identified on the periodic table as uh, an L shape. Hydrogen's over here, H2. If you start with nitrogen and go to the right, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So that's an inverted L. Okay, you just rotate it up 100 degrees, 180 degrees, and you have an L. So those are all diatomic. They're still elements. Some elements, other elements, exist in different forms. Um, they could be diatomic, they could be polyatomic. For example, uh, carbon occurs in three forms. It's still pure elemental carbon, but the structure is different. Diamond is the most desirable. Diamond has a tetrahedral structure. That means every carbon atom is bound to four other carbons, like uh, one up here, one down there, one over here, and one over there. Diamond is a tetrahedral structure. Graphite. Graphite is, is bound. The carbons in graphite are bound as hexagons. And then each one of these is bound to another one. And it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on in a two-dimensional plane. Okay. Now, what happens? You get one plane stacked on top of another. But they're not bound strongly to one another. The strong bonds are between these carbons in the plane. So those layers of graphite slide past one another very easily. That's why graphite is used as a dry lubricant because it bears the load and slides easily. That's what lubricants do. <clears throat> Another type that was discovered in the 20th century was the, the fullerenes. And the first one was the Buckminster fullerene named after the, its discoverer, Buckminster. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, actually, that's his, his full name. And it resembles a basketball. So this arrangement here is you just take the, the flat layer and bend it around, form bonds, and you make a ball. They call them buckyballs. More recently, we've discovered carbon nanotubes. So you get this hexagonal uh, arrangement and bonding but now it's open at this end and open at that end and forms a tube from one end to the other. Okay. And they're nanotubes because the dimension, their measurement dimension is on the order of 10 to the minus ninth meters, the nanometer. Okay. Uh, it went away too quick. Excuse me. Let's go back. Diamond, graphite. <laughs> I need to give it a little more time. And then Buckminster fullerenes. Those forms, carbon is an example. There are other elements have their examples, are called allotropes. They're pure elements with different structures. So that's what a nanotube would look like. 
Okay, how do we form an ion? I mentioned it earlier. With a neutral atom, the only way to form an ion is to add or subtract electrons. Most of the metals prefer losing electrons. So it makes a cation, a positively charged ion. Magnesium is in the second group, makes it uh, prefer a two plus charge. So it has to lose two electrons. And that gives, and the charge is based entirely upon the balance. If you have 12 protons and 10 electrons, you have an imbalance of two positives. That's what the charge for magnesium. Okay, uh, chlorine. Chlorine prefers a negative charge. Um, and that's characteristic of the halogens. It will gain an electron. And when you put it in the name of a compound, you change the ending. But we'll talk about that in chapter five. Okay. When we talk about nomenclature, naming compounds. All right, so alkali metals prefer plus one charge. That's the first group. Second group, plus one. Uh, halogens, just before you get to the noble gases, the next one to the left of the noble gases, you get minus one charge. Noble gases are zero. They don't form a charge. And then the others, oxygen is just next to the halogens, the calcogens. Right, right here. They prefer a minus two charge. Nitrogens, the nictogens prefer a minus three charge. And then carbon and, and uh, carbon goes either way. It can go plus four, minus four. Um, it's, it's not definite. Boron, however, prefers plus three. Plus one in this family, plus two, plus three. Okay. And we'll, I'll emphasize that again when we talk about nomenclature. Naming compounds. Okay, so these elements are the ones that have definite charges. And I say these are definite charges, particularly for the nonmetals. Those are charges when they are found in ionic compounds, which means they're the negatives, they're paired with positives, which would be a metal. So if you pair one of these with one of these, this is the preferred charge for the anion, the negative ion. In other circumstances, they assume different charges, but in ionic combination, they always take these charges. Okay. I don't know why we left out boron. Boron is plus three. Should be the end there. Okay, so I'm running long on time. Um, which one of these satisfies with 23 electrons and three, ch three plus charge? Let's see, we got another one. Oops, I only had four. With a three plus charge, and 23 electrons. Oops, 23 electrons. How many protons does that mean? If it's a three plus charge, which means we have, we're short three electrons, right? To get a three plus imbalance. That means we need three more electrons to make it neutral. So three plus 23 is 26. 26 protons means iron. So now we can replace that with Fe. How about this one? If you have a one plus charge with 54 electrons and 78 neutrons, what's the mass number? Well, to get the mass number, you need the number of protons. So if you have 54 electrons, and it's a plus one charge, that means we're short one electron. 
So we need 55 electrons plus 78 neutrons is 133. Yep, mass number. Okay, so some compounds contain ions. They'll have a metal and a non-metal together. Sodium chloride is a perfect example. But with ionic compounds, this, right, with a positive and a negative, that only tells you the simplest whole number ratio of sodium to chloride, sodium to chlorine ions. Okay? That's not the structure of the compound. Because in ionic compounds, the positives are surrounded by negatives and the negatives are surrounded by positives what we're saying is the simplest ratio is one to one but in reality when that is in the crystal lattice sodium is actually in contact with six other chlorines right and Sometimes we refer to that as the coordination number. How many other ions is this positive associated with? Six. And same for the chlorine. It's associated with six other positive charges. So uh, that's the way ionic compounds combine. And they're characterized by very high melting points. Right? If you take a solid, solid sodium chloride, heated up enough it will melt but it takes a lot of energy very high temperature over a thousand degrees celsius to melt sodium chloride um, now this needs to qual be qualified conduct electricity under what circumstances will an ionic compound conduct electricity well in order to get electricity from going from one electrode to the other which means conductor Whatever's in between has to be mobile. So you need ions that are mobile from one to the other that will carry the charge for you. In a solid crystal lattice of sodium and chloride ions, they're not mobile. They will not move charge. So solid sodium chloride and solid ionic compounds are insulators. They will not conduct. Now, if you melt them, then the ions are free to move. <clears throat> and they will conduct electricity. Or if they're soluble in water or some other uh, compound, some other liquid, say, then now you separated the ions and they will move. So sodium chloride salt water is a conductor. Ionic compounds are electrically neutral because this ratio that we establish is based upon the premise that they are neutral. And we, of course, can test it, see if they're neutral. And since they are neutral, that means that the balance of charge has to be maintained. And that ratio is established by the charges. Magnesium is a two plus charge. It's in the second family, second group. So they're all two plus. In order to combine with an anion like chloride, you need two, right? Two negatives to balance one positive. And that's why the MgCl2 is written that way. Two times a minus one equals two minuses. And one times a two plus equals two pluses. We're balanced. Net charge is zero. So how about this one? Let's see if we can identify this one, given the information that we're shown. Right? We have an unknown element combined with chlorine. All right. Um, 
X as its ion contains only 20 electrons. Okay, with that information, can we identify X? Well, let's see what we know. We know if this is the correct formula, and we know that this is minus one, then two times that is two minus, this must be two plus, right? Because there's only one of them. So now, if we know that the charge is two plus, and we have 20 electrons, then there is a deficiency of two electrons. So we need to add more, two more electrons to balance those two equals 22 electrons in the neutral atom. And the neutral atom says that the electrons are equal to the protons. So we have 22 protons. Now we can identify what it is. We just go down here to our periodic table and find 22, titanium. So X is equal to titanium. Well, actually, it's titanium 2 plus. Okay. Now we're getting there. I'm just slow. Okay. If we're given a member of the alkaline earth metal family. So which one is that? A member of the alkaline earth metal family is in the second column. So it has to be one of these. Most stable ion contains 36 electrons and forms a compound with bromine. What's the correct formula? All right. So let's extract from this word problem the information that we know. and bring it out of the smoke so we can see the, the truth. Alkaline earth metal family. Okay, so we know that uh, in a compound, they're always gonna have two plus charge. That's characteristic of that family. And the ion is 36 electrons. Okay. So if we're going to combine it with bromine, which is a minus one charge, it's a halogen, then we need to identify what X is. So here we have 36 electrons, but we need two more to balance that two plus. 38 electrons, which means 38 protons, which means we go down here till we find 38 strontium so strontium combines with bromine and we need two bromines because this is a two plus charge and that's a one minus charge so the answer is d okay we're done i'm only half hour over so uh, next time we meet uh day after tomorrow we'll look at nomenclature. So between now and then, if you haven't already, you need to start memorizing those symbols and learning how to use them in writing compounds because we're gonna start naming them. And if you don't know the symbols, you can't write the compounds and properly name them. Okay, uh, let's see, let me stop the share. There we go. And, um, I'm done for today, unless you have questions. Okay, we'll see you in a couple of days. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.